Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, a podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek. And as promised, we're talking about Socrates today. I hope you all went home and read Plato's Apology. That's that's what I did. <laughs> uh, I hope you had a good time. I, I don't know how much of a good time can be promised in reading Plato's Apology. It's worthwhile, wouldn't you say? For for knowing what it says, it's worthwhile for to read. For knowing what it says. <laughs> well, and some of it gives you a glimpse into the culture and the way that they talked. I think mm-hmm. it was more, it gave me a sense of the personality of people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I'm i a sucker for historical figures. Like, just getting to know somebody, it's like, all right, Socrates, he's kind of winsome. You know, he's funny. Like, I, you know diametrically opposed on every point but you know he's fun yes he is a character yes yes oh well to backtrack a little um because we overflowed into socrates last time (laughs) this is the age of athenian democracy which was a blip in greek history most of the time athens and the surrounding communities were um under the thumb of tyrants. Tyr- all tyrant meant was someone grabbed power without legitimate authority. Given the nature of Athens, it's hard to imagine what exactly legitimate means in that context, but mm-hmm. somehow somebody sees power. And people mm-hmm. might have liked it or not liked it. The tyrant might have been a good tyrant or a bad tyrant. He just wasn't. It's almost like if you read of the, the Roman dictators, like yeah. dictator was not a negative term. It was a job no, that they no. gave people. Yeah, yeah. He actually yeah. made people dictators for the present Either crisis. the length of a war or yeah, maybe life could, if you really liked him. <laughs> and that dictator could do whatever he wanted until he was over. Then he was subject to review by the Senate or whoever. Uh, tyrants in, uh, in Greece weren't exactly open to review, but neither did they pass leadership onto their children normally. So we've passed out of that briefly into the thing that history books hail as the golden age of Greece, the beginning of freedom and liberty and man getting to know man for what he really is and read Edith Hamilton, um, (laughs) all that stuff, Uh, which practically meant that the citizens of Athens ruled democratically their own town. Now, the citizens were about, if I recall, about 30% of the population. They were male, past the age of majority, property owners of some sort. Uh, there were slaves in Athens. There was a, a healthy foreign class that did a lot of the work and business. And, of course, women mostly stayed home, unless you were a high priestess of something. Uh, but... Americans are really shady on this, this, what democracy is. Democracy meant you got into the same room where you could look each other in the eyeball and yell at each other and plead with each other, and then you voted. And 50% plus one carried the day for that day. Of course, you could all come back tomorrow if you get everybody back in the same room and completely change everything. There were no absolutes. There were no outgoing moral standards beyond vague feelings of but we've never done it that way before. And so into this, people who were wealthy, had businesses, had prospects for the future, it was important to them to be able to sway the assembly because the assembly, not being bound by any by God's law, let alone any other law, could pass laws that would affect your business, that would make it... Uh, more profitable, open it up to wider trade, or shut it down. So you really, really, really wanted to be able to persuade people. And you, since by now your your boys are coming of age, you finally take an interest in their education, which you haven't done really yet. We'll talk about Greek education another day when we want to be sick to our stomachs. Um, Mm -hmm. And um, you, you get your boys trained to be able to win arguments, and I think that's crucial in all this, not have the logically best argument. Who cares about that? It's not but, about the truth. Yeah, it's not about truth. It's about persuading people. And uh, the traveling um, teachers, tutors, whom they hired, uh, were called sophists, from the Greek word sophia, or sophia meaning 
wisdom. So these were wise men, or we would say wise guys. And it's into this that we find Socrates, who technically was a sophist, because that's he, he did all this, except <laughs> he he had this thing about actually being logically right and and finding the real truth in everything. And apparently, that, according to Plato's apology, he wouldn't take money for it. No, and he didn't get paid, no, because it's truth and truth should be free. Which makes which endears him to us a little bit, I suppose. He was <laughs> well, not <laughs> it kind of weaponizes that. In the <laughs> oh yes. Oh yes. But it sounds good on paper. Right. Uh, he um was not a handsome man. He had a shrew of a wife, at least that's Plato's take on it. Uh so he wasn't home much and he wandered around asking questions of people, usually of important people, people who claim to be something and to know something. And it got and, and a crowd of young people, young men did gather around him and follow him around to, to see the show. They like to see important people embarrassed when they floundered for answers. And this eventually, we're cutting through a lot here, leads us to him being brought to trial. Um, and the accusations, legal formal accusations were he corrupts the youth <laughs> and um, you can see where that comes from and he teaches gods not sanctioned by the state and it occurs to me suddenly that that is a very odd accusation and Plato denies it completely except when he doesn't it'd be interesting to, to actually go back in time and find out if the real trial as opposed to Plato's version of it deals more with that. Because that's a huge, that's actually, given Greek culture, that's huge. Mm -hmm. And Socrates is allowed, as we'll see, to kind of, to brush it off and, and they don't, the accusers don't pursue it. <clears throat> anyway, uh, as he's as he's brought to trial, he, uh, first of all, he starts by telling everybody that he's not a philosopher. He doesn't claim any deep wisdom. He doesn't claim to know stuff, which is a convenient kind of out here. I don't know anything. I don't <laughs> know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to much. I All I do is ask questions. Yes. <laughs> That's the problem. It's, uh, it's so interesting. The rhetorical turn that happens during the during the apology on that point is he begins by saying, listen, I don't think I'm wiser than anyone. Mm -hmm. I think you're all equally stupid and just as stupid <laughs> as I am. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah, it's, it's a little, it's subtle. It's a sleight of hand, but that is the gist of what he says. That is, that is, that's exactly what he says. Uh, except there's, there's one other thing that goes with that. He, one of his friends, he says, goes to the Oracle of Delphi, mm -hmm. who of course, the world held in awe, uh, and asked the question, is there anyone, any man in Athens wiser than Socrates? And the oracle, strangely clear and blunt, it seems, says, no, there's no man wiser than Socrates. Well, I think it's interesting that they, nobody picks up on the ambiguity of that statement. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's does that mean that no, there's anybody wise? How could that wise? be ambiguous? What? Well, it's like, does that mean that Socrates is the wisest? Yeah. Does it mean he has any wisdom at all? Yeah. No. no. <laughs> it, it just says that there's nobody better. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, Socrates uh, says that he, uh, being a pious man, doesn't flat out say, "Boy, did the uh, did the uh, oracle get that one wrong?" <laughs> but he is a little impious in that he thinks, "What what can the oracle possibly mean by that?" Because I'm not the smartest guy around here. So he finds someone in Athens who's renowned for wisdom and intelligence and knowledge and all that, and goes and talks to him. We're not given uh, account of what exactly he asked, but given Plato's later dialogues, it's probably a series of, well, we, we've coined the phrase Socratic dialogue, <laughs> where Socrates will ask one question after another until he gets an answer or clarification. What do you mean by epistemology? What do you mean by no? What do you mean by not knowing? What do you mean by you know, keep going? And eventually, this man he's talking to, after getting nervous and frustrated and trying to divert things, 
probably yells at him and tells him to get out of his shop because he's got work to do. And what kind of fool is he anyway? And word gets around that this happened. And the man Socrates talked to was not happy. But among the young men who are looking for uh, teachers, some say, hey, do you hear what happened? Let's go watch the next one. And so Socrates um, goes to someone else, someone this time with philosophical pretensions and begins to ask him the same kind of thing. And he gets the same kind of response. What he finds again and again is not that these people are ignorant of all things. They actually know a lot about their own particular field, craft, trade, whatever. But there are a lot of things where they are simply making huge assumptions about life, the universe, and everything, and taking a great deal for granted. And they don't have explanations. They don't have definitions. They have not thought through things. And in the end, Socrates decides that what the oracle meant was that Socrates at least knows he doesn't know anything, and these people haven't got there yet. And from this, Socrates says he develops a mission. Apparently, he thinks the oracle by this has commissioned him to go wake up Athens, to prod it into action, to deliver it from its intellectual slumbers. He calls himself the gadfly of Athens. The gadfly is a horse fly. A little fly stings a horse, and the whole horse and rushes off, uh, not knowing what's at him. That's what I am, Socrates says. I'm here to sting the state. I'm just this little guy. But if I can wake up Athens and get them, get her people to start thinking about things and making intelligent decisions in terms of an absolute truth of some sort, then I will have done my job. And yes, I'm sure that people are offended, but you know what? That's their problem. They shouldn't be. They should be thankful, which comes across, of course, when he has to propose a, an alternative um, penalty at the end of the trial. Uh, Emily, you was, since you did read it last night, do you have any other observations along this line so far before we get to uh, the voice in his head? Um, I think that was a, a very good summary, of course, that there's just little details here that I'm sure we'll come up as we go. <laughs> <laughs> Along the way, Socrates, well, first of all, he does answer directly the charge that he's an atheist, which was not the charge. The charge was right. that you teach deities taught by not sanctioned by the state. Although the, uh, the accuser is extremely skillless in this prosecution. Yes. <laughs> um, he he lets Socrates argue him into changing his charges. Yeah, yeah. Um, because he he says he's been teaching gods not sanctioned by the state um, instead of the state gods, and and Socrates says, "Oh, do you mean that I'm an atheist?" And he says, "Yes, I swear by Zeus that you are an atheist." It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like really. Really, yeah. which yeah. makes you wonder how much was Plato's uh, right. adaptation versus yeah. the reality that he makes Certainly. Socrates, and he makes everyone else look as foolish as Socrates says they are, <laughs> which is a pattern in Plato, right? <laughs> mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I swear you are a complete atheist. You don't believe in any gods. Well. And then Socrates takes him on that obvious. Well, you say I believe in in divinities. That means either gods or heroes, demigods. So those are gods. And you can't believe so in I, demigods without believing in their parents, who would have yeah, to be gods. So right. there you go, logically. Yeah. So that's <laughs> so you're being stupid and don't know what you're saying. And uh, the ref he gets. Um, his accuser to to say yes, you believe that what the sun is a stone and the moon is I forget what. Oh, Earth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we uh, the, another point was that Socrates had been satirized so many times oh, yes. in Greek plays, oh, yes. comedies. At this point, Aristophanes has famous caricatures of Socrates arguing ridiculous things just to be laughed at in his right. plays. So and Socrates said, is like, yeah, everybody laughs at that. You know that's not me, right? <laughs> <laughs> said that Socrates went to uh, the production of The Clouds and laughed a little louder than anybody at this caricature of himself. Because this was, as he points out, other philosophers before me said things like that. Everybody mm -hmm. knows that. It's a matter of, um, as you say, the playhouse. Uh, we, we, we know this and it's, it's a joke. 
So yeah, that's these words nothing. came from somebody else. You can't convict me on the strength of these words that yeah, somebody else said first. And especially since everyone laughs at the idea anyway. So that's no threat to anybody. So get past that. And and then he drops it because he still hasn't really addressed what sort of God he does believe in. But he comes across it later. Um, the, in the translation I have, he says this, You've often heard me speak of an oracle or sign which comes to me and is the divinity which Miletus ridicules in the indictment. The sign I've had ever since I was a child, the sign is a voice which comes to me and always forbids me to do something which I'm going to do, but never commands me to do anything. And that's what stands in my way of being a politician. Socrates' humor again. Uh, Socrates is saying, he hears a voice in his head. Uh, and liberal theologians and philosophers and rationalists have all pretty much agreed. Well, it's a figure of speech. It's a joke. It's, he's putting it's us on. Conscience. It's his conscience. You know, uh, it's not what he says. <laughs> not you what know, he says. you can. <laughs> uh, he's been following, and he takes it seriously right to the end. The reason he's willing to stand trial and even drink the poison at the end is because the voice does not forbid him. This is interesting. There is a book, and I have it referenced here someplace. If I can find it real fast. James Hans, Socrates and the Irrational, published in 2006 by University, University of Virginia Press. He actually works through all this. He's, he's not a Christian, as far as I can tell. He's a thoroughgoing secularist. Uh, and uh, he's a fan of Socrates in that he wants to know more about the guy, but he does not seem... Um, um, what, what he doesn't seem to be a fangirl. <laughs> uh, he he, but he listens to what Socrates is actually saying, and his take on this is: uh, this is a voice that is external to Socrates. It's not his conscience. It's not him thinking things through on his own. It's not part of his moral formation. It's something that stands outside of him and simply says no. It does not tell him what to do doesn't tell him why to do something or not to do something. It simply puts up prohibitions. So whatever it is, um, you people, you scholars out there need to reckon with what he actually claims is going on here. Now, Socrates didn't have really a name for it, but those who came after it, after him and wrote about it, called it a daimon, D-A-I-M-O-N, which is the same word that the New Testament writers use when they want to talk about those things that, G that Jesus cast out of people, demons. Mm -hmm. And they would have known that. It's not a, a linguistic or philological accident that they pick that word. Let's find a word that, and uh, they knew what, they knew how that word had been used in the past. And once and again, more in the Greek it. mindset, yeah. there's not a negative connotation. No, it's there's a not. power. It's yeah. something that is known to be greater than man, supernatural in some sense. Yeah, the negative up. connotation comes for us from the Bible. <laughs> from the Bible. That's yeah, a bubbling up of uh, sexonic energies that take brief possession of you. It's like Agamemnon when he, at the end of the Trojan War, says, I didn't intend any of this. It must have been some god. That some kind diamond. Of thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because uh, I would never have done this. I'm better than this. Yeah, right. But whatever. He he does blame it on some kind of um, not not a name god, but some kind of supernatural power from beneath it that takes possession of him. And, there, and Greek literature is full of of this kind of thing. So when Socrates says this, he's not speaking of the void. It's not like people had never heard this kind of thing before. And yes, no negative connotations. It's basically they. I think the Greek people who were there would have said. More or less what he says, it's the voice of a god of some sort, mm -hmm. however temporary, speaking in Socrates' head. If that's the case, then we probably shouldn't mess with this. They, they, he, he doesn't convince them, but he does say that uh, in the end, the vote is more in his favor than he thought it would be. But in making this claim, he is claiming a direct channel to deity that bypasses the whole system of Athens, uh, Athena and her her formal worship, as well as all the Olympians, even Apollo, although Apollo may have had some part in this, at least in 
throwing the switch or at least throwing a light on the thing. He does not claim to be speaking for Apollo. That would have been useful. If he could have said, I am the voice of Apollo, that would put him at least firmly within the system, if still kind of a rogue within that system, but at least he'd have the backing of one of the Olympians. And he he very deliberately doesn't say that. So we're, we're left with this um, weirdness that uh, is a real problem for uh, Western writers. And I don't remember when I first encountered this in Socrates. It may have been the first time that I read the Apology, which I think was in a philosophy class in, in college. But certainly none of the history texts I've ever read have ever talked about this and about what uh, Socrates actually claimed for himself. Christians who have known about it have tried to excuse it away. Because very early on in the history of the church, and Rachel, when you write your book on church history, I'd appreciate it if you'd spend at least a few paragraphs on this, because this, this is something that's come back to bite us a lot. Uh, there has been an attempt to compare Jesus to Socrates, or mm -hmm. Socrates to Jesus, mm -hmm. depending on how you look at it. Uh, well, look at the similarities. They're both single men, itinerant preachers. Uh, they gather a band of disciples about themselves, sort of. Um, they go out and they confront people with the truth and absolute truth. Challenge until, the religious establishment. Yeah, and the political one until that all conspires together to have the man executed. He is tried. And he goes uh, he willingly does, to death. And he goes willingly to death. Um, see, they're just alike, aren't they? <laughs> to the point that many of the church fathers were willing to say that Socrates was a Gentile foreshadowing of Christ on the same level as um, Moses or David or some such person in the Old Testament. And, and perhaps even stronger because the resemblances in their mind were, were even closer and clearer. And you still kind of get this in some Christian circles today. And it is frightening, it's offensive, it's ridiculous. And yet try to convince Christians who have university degrees that Socrates may well have been demon possessed. And you get the look, same look that they throw at, you know, fundamentalists when they remind you that Jesus is coming back. Um, it's just so ridiculous to the point of uncomfortable. Who let them in the room? Don't they know that everyone here has to have a university degree in philosophy, history, or sociology? These people have done nothing but read their Bibles, and they've come up with the most outlandish things. Socrates, demon-possessed? Well, it's what he says. Well, it's but they don't under Go ahead. I was going to say, it's one of those very uh, sinister and um, sometimes very hard to identify errors that the church has always faced, where we, when we want to be able to hold on to some of the worldly philosophy, whether it's because we studied it before we became a Christian or somebody that we respect tells us how great these philosophies are, but we always want to hold on to and mix. Yes. Uh, we want to syncretize and say, oh, but I can see, you know, I, I can see how he's like Christ. I can see how this, you know, echoes the gospel. It's like, well, yes, because of common grace, but we, we need to be very clear where their foundations are. and. You started describing how Socrates was like Jesus, and you got to the second sentence, and I wanted to be like, I have an objection. <laughs> he was not a preacher. <laughs> um, but it, it, we want to Christianize lots of things and yes. uh, because it allows us to feel more comfortable in lots of different settings um, and not have to challenge and, and hold to that very narrow way, as Jesus calls us to. Mm -hmm. There is yes. a, a joke on the internet that has a significant amount of truth in it. And I think uh, it's easier to see the truth in it when we're talking about fiction, that secularists often make the mistake of trying to create a secular work in a Christian universe. Yes. <laughs> and it's it's like, if you didn't want to remind us of the truth, you shouldn't have written something that was so true. <laughs> um, <laughs> And yes. the, the thing is, when it's fiction, everyone's acknowledging this is fake. Yeah. It's telling us something true, but that is not 
uh, it's not, it's, what's the word? Uh, Ostensible purpose. Yeah. Um, And so when it's the philosophers where we can like dig through and be like, yeah, here's what that actually means. (laughs) Um, That's not how they meant it. It's a different, it's a different thing and it has to be treated differently. You know, back to the one of the reasons we read (laughs) and read old books Mm -hmm. is so that we're not bound by people who are, or even our own um, interpretation of, well, if I were saying this, I would mean Mm -hmm. you weren't the one who was saying it and you don't have the same thought forms or, or structure or basis. So it's just possible that the original speaker meant something very, very different. Um, one line comes to me, uh, something Rush Juni wrote, um, when a, a Roman conqueror was receiving a triumph, he's going through the crowds and everyone's cheering him and they're holding the laurel wreath over him. There's supposed to be a man behind him saying, remember, you are a man. Remember, you are a man. <laughs> and traditionally, the West has said, oh, they're reminding him to be humble. No, (laughs) that's exactly what they're not doing. You are man, full-blown, come of age. You, In other words, you're a god. Well, that's not what that word means. It's what it meant to them. That's how they would understand it. You're not humbling this guy. They're reminding him of how great he is. Man is the measure of all things, as Protagoras, a sophist would say. Uh, and, And so knowing background, knowing context... Is important now. If you've never heard of Socrates, um, that's nice and all, but the problem is, people that you had as teachers in college have. Mm-hmm. We we can't really retreat to a desert island and shut off our cultural past and assume that nothing in the past is going to affect us because we're going to be ignorant of all of it. We're not even going to get side references or. When we watch Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and they run into somebody they call... recommendation. (laughs) No, wait, I was going to... (laughs) Okay. When they say Socrates, um, you know, we we are expected to know who that is. Uh, It's... We are part of a much bigger story than we imagine and its themes and nuances come to us in a million directions. And oddly enough, pop culture tends to be one of the more powerful ones. Mm -hmm. I will lay odds that a lot of, well, maybe not in this generation, because this generation doesn't remember Bill and Ted. It's too far back. (laughs) But in my generation, everybody knew who Bill and Ted was, and probably more people knew about Socrates from from that than from ever having read anything he ever, was ever written about him by Plato, or um, anything that their history of philosopher teachers ever said. They didn't know a thing about the guy. And so that literally was their introduction to Socrates. And although he comes across in that movie as a little bit bumbling, you are left, as you are with some of the other characters, Abraham Lincoln particularly, as someone somewhat noble and who really would have fit into the 20th century if he'd had a chance (laughs) and would have had things to say to us that would have been fascinating uh, too bad we don't really understand what's going on here. That from a silly movie that wasn't really, I don't think, trying to change our worldview. It was just going with what it was. It's a play <laughs> on the ignorance of teenagers. To be excellent, yeah. an excellent yes. movie. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, excellent to one another. The other way for Christians, we have to remind ourselves that th- that the world is is a whole and that at this time you had Jewish people um, being dispersed, whether as slaves or not. And so there is high likelihood that they're interacting with these people and vice versa. So there can be some sharing of ideas, but also when we come to the New Testament, like what Emily said earlier about their idea of demons, that's actually really helpful when we see Jesus go into Gentile territory and cast out demons. Um, yeah. It changes our perspective. And so even if we don't encounter Socrates and we don't read, you know, the Apology or something or Plato, uh, we have to realize that all of that is interacting with what we read in the Bible. And therefore, it becomes important partly because it's what people uh, in the New Testament can be addressing and speaking against. 
-hmm. when Pilate says, what is truth, Mm -hmm. that stands against the whole background of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and the failure of their attempt to find answers and the rise of the Hellenistic philosophers, the Stoics, the Epicureans, the Skeptics, the Cynics, who admitted there were no answers to speak of. And so when Pilate says that, he's not just a high school kid who doesn't want to really get serious about life and says, what does it really matter? No, he's, he's an educated man. He knows who Socrates is. He knows who Plato is. He knows who Aristotle is. He's, he knows of the Stoics and the Cynics, and he's willing to say, our culture has no answers. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So you're talking truth. Really, what is truth? An he interesting, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, the, an interesting counterpoint um, where we can see the contrast is in Japanese literature now, mm. because that does not come from the tradition that had that whole history of Socrates and Greek Mm-hmm. Daimonia. Um, and so now there's a huge conversation about Japanese literature and how to translate the word that we typically translate demons, because mm. they don't mean what we mean by it. They, it might yes. mean monster. <laughs> it might mean, it could mean a lot of different things, but for sure, it doesn't mean what the Greeks meant by it. Uh, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> well, for sure. It doesn't mean what we mean by what the Greeks meant by it, because the the gospel went west. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What? Uh, and, and, and yet, you know, there are only so many possible worldviews. Right. And my brief introduction to Japanese culture through some of the best anime that there is, Miyazaki and such, you, you get a peek behind the scenes. And in English translation, some of it's lost. But uh, the first time I saw, for instance, um, Totoro. It was with subtitles done by a friend of ours who is thoroughly Western in most respects. Um, And we began to see a little more clearly what's going on here. These Shintoist shrines Mm -hmm. every place. Uh, It's an animistic culture. There are demons everywhere. There are spirits with or without the negative connotation. And that this is a basic force behind their culture. And it does pervade anime more than people Mm -hmm. understand because we're not tuned to actually take Japanese culture seriously. Yeah. Um, And Japanese culture has been westernized and Mm -hmm. humanisticized a good deal. (laughs) Uh, It's it's felt the the acids of Western humanism and -hmm. rationalism to a point, but since the gospel never won over the people... There's not that yet. constant pull back. Yeah, not yet. Uh, one hopes soon. Uh, one other thing about uh, this um, teaching unsanctioned gods. Socrates does say at one point, for I do believe that there are gods, and in a far higher sense uh, than that in which any of my accusers believe in them. <laughs> And as I ask in the original article, imagine a controversial theologian saying something like this before a church council or a church court. I I believe in Jesus on a higher level than any of you do. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> ah, really winning he, points there. Yeah, that's not the answer we want to hear. In other words, you just rejected our whole system, system revealed in scripture for your conception which apparently transcends human reason, human history, the church creeds, and what the church has been preaching for 2,000 years. You have a better Jesus. You have a better God. <laughs> you could easily the- imagine a transcendentalist arguing this before. Oh, him. absolutely. <laughs> Abs- that's exactly the kind of thing Emerson would say. Mm-hmm. Well, I forget which of the uh, the New York Orthodox theologians it was. It might have been Tillich. I don't remember for sure. But he um, he speaks of the God behind God. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we we know about the God of the West, the God of common Christianity. That's not the God I'm talking about. I'm talking about the God who's better than that and behind all that. Like, you don't know what you're talking Well, he's an existentialist. So no, of course he doesn't know. He doesn't <laughs> claim to know. That's the point. It's it's something bigger than human reason. The, the, the bumper sticker I refer to often, I haven't seen it in a long while, but 
God is too great to be contained in any one system of religion. Which sounds like it's appealing to the transcendence of God. All it's doing is making God irrelevant. God cannot reveal himself completely. Mm -hmm. Which means practically, I can give him a, a, a nod of the head if I like. I'm not even required to do that because who knows? Maybe he doesn't appreciate that. I don't know what he appreciates. I don't know if he's a he or an it or a she or whatever. Uh, whatever God is, is not something I can put in a box. Not something I can write anything about meaningfully. And Socrates was not too far from that in this claim. And if the people were listening, and that's what he really said, that would be grounds right there for conviction. You, you're you saying that what we have encoded in our laws about the Olympians and about Athena is incorrect and incomplete and insufficient, and you answer to a higher deity of some sort. Um, right, that we'll would be a confession. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, 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 you can go talk to the gods then. Uh, and that brings us to, to his conviction. He is tried. He is convicted. He claims that it's uh, not by as large a percentage as he expected, and, he, and that if he had had more time, maybe he could have won more of them over. Uh, and so the second phase, the, the penalty um, trial goes into place. His enemies, of course, ask, for the death sentence, which would mean that he's sentenced to drink hemlock and kill himself. And he, as the defendant, is told that he has to propose an alternative sentence. The obvious one would be banishment, and they might probably would have gotten away with that. He was popular, and there were a lot of people there who didn't really want to see him dead. But he says, well, Very I've much been... does not want that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been loyal to truth all my days, and the truth is I've been doing the state a favor. I'm, I'm to the state as a doctor, trying to help you all get better, and uh, the proper thing would be a pension. You can pay mm -hmm. me such and such amount of money. You should take care of me the way of, you take care of your Olympian heroes. Yes. Win the games. Yeah. They didn't like that. <laughs> so he is sentenced to death. Emily, you were telling me you you read the Crito or some of it last night. You want to tell us what yeah, goes on there? I, I glanced at it. I have read it in more detail, but um, not very recently. But the Crito, Crito is Socrates' friend, and he does appear in the text of the Apology. Um, but he's one of these people that he points out as like, I could have called my sons up to weep and wail and... Uh, garner your sympathies but i'm not going to do that i'm just going to point to my friends who know what's up <laughs> out there <laughs> in the assembly uh crito is one of these people and crito and his buddies have worked out an escape plan where they want to help socrates escape the city rather than drinking hemlock and dying and socrates in a dialogue of course because that's the way plato writes socrates um argues that no that would be contrary to justice and contrary to what he believes, it would be going back on what he believes about death and the gods and uh, the honor of his position to run out like a rat, basically. Mm. So it's worth reading. It's fun. But it's, uh, I don't think, super, super relevant to this conversation. Well, there is this. Aristotle will say man is by nature a political animal and he who by nature and not mere accident, is without a state, a polis, is either above humanity or below it. Uh, man's a political animal. Man is a creature who lives in a polis. The polis is the definition of humanity. Uh, over the centuries, we've had people try to define man in terms of society. He's a social animal. He's a religious animal. He's a worshiping animal. He's a tool maker. He's a Word maker, you know, we, we we've the sciences have all tried to exalt some facet of of human nature and say this is what makes man man. To the Greeks, it was simple. It was the polis. It mm -hmm. was the city state. Yeah. That's what makes you human. If you have a city state, if you belong to a city state, you are a man. If you don't, there are only two possibilities: you're a god, and thus belong to the city state of the gods, or you're a beast, and have not achieved humanity. And this does bear on, not that I want to go there particularly right now, but it does bear on the the pro-life arguments. Well, the baby in the womb is alive because we have all of you know, these check marks we can we can check off. And um, but the response of the world is yes, but society has not recognized that 
yet. And as Christians, we say, what? No, I'm sorry. That's for lots and lots of centuries. That's how the world looked at things. Mm -hmm. If you, it, it, you're defined in terms of your relationship to the state and to the society it encapsulates. If you have not been received and accepted by the state, you're not human. You don't count. This is something that Christianity rescued us from. And we seem to be willing to go full-fledged back into it. You know, when, when I was a kid, if you wanted to combat relativism, there was a real simple way. You pulled up the Holocaust. Because in those days, you know, and that's only 40 years ago, you, all you had to say was, um, well, was it wrong for the Nazis to kill 6 million Jews? And at that moment, everybody started backpedaling. It didn't matter how relev relativistic you were. You couldn't say, well, you know, if they wanted to, sure. You backpedaled. You, you made up things. You made excuses. You no, know, but that's, well, that's kind of different. In other words, you weren't honest with yourself. And you weren't consistent with your presuppositions. Today, more likely, you will hear, what's a Holocaust? And when it's explained, well, if that that's can't really have happened. Okay, first of all, that's there's too that. horrific. It couldn't. It must be propaganda. Yeah. Or if that's what happened, and that's what their culture decided, then who are we to judge them? And that's frightening. Mm -hmm. Now, why do I say all this? Because Socrates is given an opportunity to desert his polis his city-state, his point of identity. And despite his supernatural connection with something else, he has labored as the gadfly of Athens. It's Athens where he belongs. It's Athens where he ministers. It's Athens that's the focus of what he does. He can't give that up because if he does, he will be effectively a beast. He's not willing to claim to be a god. Uh, and, and so um, he ends up... Um, thinking about what people have said about death, uh, and I don't remember this is, if this is from uh, the Crito. There's another account also of his uh, of his death. I forget the name, but he he argues. Well, you know, we don't really know what lies beyond. If if the poets should be believed, I may find their Achilles. Uh, and that's and at the end of the apology. Okay, uh, he finds all of the all the he mentions all the people he may see, mm -hmm. and the wonderful conversations he'll have, and all the questions he'll get to ask. And if that's the case, that could be good. No, he doesn't know that that's the case, but he doesn't know it's not, and neither do his disciples. And so, in the end, he his um, farewell is: "I go to life, or I go to death. You go to life. Who God knows which is best." So there's a. Um, an agnosticism toward death. And since he doesn't know it's bad, he has every hope to believe that it's good and that it'll be a lot of fun. It'll be a blast. It'll be an intellectual party. He found out he was wrong, sadly enough. And this is the man that a lot of Christians have turned into a Christ figure. And it should concern us. Um, Next time, we'll talk about Plato and the Republic, and even more than Socrates, Plato has, <laughs> in this last generation or two, has become the heart of classical education. There is a uh, Christian university that I will not name, out of courtesy, that has as a symbol of their honors program uh, a picture of, it's from um, oh, the School of Philosophy by Raphael in... Uh, mm. School of Athens? Yeah where Plato is standing with his finger pointing up toward heaven and Aristotle with his hand stretched down to the earth. That symbol is the symbol of their search for truth and beauty and wisdom, I think are the three words. Goodness, truth, and beauty, perhaps? Yeah, good, yes, thank you. Like, um, no? <laughs> what? What are you... Th uh, so we'll, we still have... We, we yet have a few more things to say about Greek culture because right now... Among thinking Christians, the ancient Greeks are more of a threat than Hegel or Kant or um, Kierkegaard, honestly. Because no Although we can't them. read the ancient Greeks without reading them through the lens of Hegel and Kierkegaard <laughs> because they came after. It's kind of uh, a catch-22. That 22. is true. That is very true, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean by all of this anyway? Mm -hmm. um, so next time, Lord willing, we will look at uh, the Republic 
one of the first uh, exercises in role playing <laughs> as they create their own city and in a search for justice. <laughs> You thought that role players were all nerds. Well, maybe we are. But. Well, maybe Plato <laughs> is a nerd too. <laughs> In fact, I, I think that could uh, easily be argued from the text. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, speaking of the text, do you have any recommendations for us? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I'm picking up on uh, since you're since you won Bill and Ted. I'm going to go back to the TV series I was talking about last time. That's Columbo. Uh, starring Peter Falk. It was originally a uh, rotating movie series. Um, uh, NBC? Um, it was either the Wednesday, I think it was the Wednesday night movie. It might have been the, but um, Hollywood came up with this brilliant idea of let's not have a, uh, a series, half an hour, an hour. Let's do an hour and a half series. And we'll rotate them. We'll have two or three or four different ones in rotation. So we have more time to do it and do it well. And they, they came up with some good things out of this. Came um, a number of movie series that you probably may not remember. McLeod and Banachek, and I don't remember all the others. But the one I'm recommending is Columbo, starring Peter Falk. Uh, and as Emily pointed out last time, yes, he's the guy who plays the grandfather in Princess Bride. So no one has an excuse not to know who Peter Falk is. <laughs> <coughs> he made his first appearance in a T Tony Curtis movie called The Great Race, where he oh, played the where he played the henchman uh, the henchman of uh, Jack Lemmon, the bad guy, <laughs> um, and uh, was was funny there. And he's not. His humor in Columbo is the humor of a Socrates. He is plays the simpleton, the honest man, the man who seems poorly educated. He has an Italian background, so it's with a little bit of uh, fresh off the boat there. Uh, he has a wife whose name is Mrs. Columbo. We'd never find out much more about that. Um, but she seems like a typical Italian kind of wife who makes typical Italian kind of food. And Columbo is constantly being assigned cases that involve the bright, beautiful, rich people, one of whom who has committed a murder. And we're shown, and this was, this was a twist back then, we are shown the murder up front. We're shown who did it, how they did it, why they did it, and such. And so it's not a whodunit, it's a how is Columbo going to figure this out and prove it? Because the, he's dealing with someone who's really, really smart. How could this bubbling... Influence and power and money. Yeah. Yeah, and, and sometimes they appeal to this. I know I'm a, I have a friend called the commissioner who will be dealing with you. Wow, I'm going to have your badge, lieutenant. You know all that kind of thing. Well, he has the track record that his superiors always back up, so that never goes anyplace. But you you don't get that. Oh, if I offended you, I am so sorry. I did not mean that. You know that kind of thing. Until he springs his trap, and then it's just there's no way out. And it's obvious if I'm caught. And wow. <laughs> Anyway, uh, the series went on for a long time, and then a later came back when he, Peter Falk was a bit older, and then I think he may have come back again with the last few episodes. Most of them are really good. The first one, and we were talking earlier about, uh, before we started recording, about the first season of series. The first mm -hmm. couple of Columbos mm -hmm. are, are good, but they, they don't really let the characters shine, so you might want to start two or three or four in. They're clean. Uh, it's um, Columbo's a charming character, uh, and the most famous B-list of stars in Hollywood all showed up sooner or later. So if you know that era at all, you'll recognize all the all the players, um, and they're well written, and it's fun, and it has the movie series has a great theme, which I will not try to hum for you now. <laughs> so there you go, Columbo. Watch it, enjoy it. All right. As promised, I recommend Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> uh, it's just a rollicking good time. Um, Socrates. Socrates. This is the, the connection point. Yes. That his, his famous line is, the wisest man is he that knows that he knows nothing. Mm -hmm. And Bill and Ted turn to each other and say, dude, that's us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never felt something so deeply in all my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it there. Rachel? <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, 
So mine is two parts because after we finished the podcast last time, I realized I forgot to say part of my recommendation, oh. <laughs> which is um, after watching the Let My People Go uh, video, um, my husband, David, and I decided to actually follow up on his um his petition of the need to confess our sins. And so we actually did a specific prayer evening at our church um, where we actually did like a prayer through the covenant um, and praying basically the ways that we as a nation have broken the covenant um, and then specifically praying through the Ten Commandments. And so after we did that, a number of the people in the church went, wow, we've never really prayed that way before. We've never thought to pray that way um, and to identify ourselves with our whole nation and to think through all those things. Um, and I've heard a number of other people have done that as well uh, recently. And so that was part of the recommendation that I forgot, which is um, think about maybe the ways that we should be praying as groups and as churches to um, confess our sin as the American church and then as the American people. So there's a little extra on that. Um, but then my recommendation for this week is an Alicia Childers podcast that I listen oh, to. Yeah. Uh, where she is interviewing Vadi Bakum about mm. his newest book. And his new book came out purposefully at the beginning of the month of June um, <laughs> be because it is called It's Not Like Being Black How Sexual Activists mm. Hijacked the Civil Rights Movement. Mm. And it's a, it was really interesting to listen to his initial explanation. I'm still waiting to get the book of how the um, the whole LGBTQ movement have basically co-opted the civil rights movement and kind of made themselves one with that group and that their suffering is the same as the suffering of rate, you know, those that have experienced racism and these other things. And they've turned something that should be a moral issue into this social issue. Um, and so it's, it was a really fascinating look that I hadn't thought about before. Um, plus, Vadi Bakum is just always an interesting character to listen to uh, if you haven't already on a number of things, such as cultural Marxism and ethnic Gnosticism and that sorts of, <laughs> of things. Um, so anyway, that one just came out recently and seemed like a, a useful, useful tool in our time um, for people to look into. Yeah, that's great. It seems very much to follow on the heels of his book, Fault Lines. Yes. Uh, yeah. About critical theory. Well, and he said he has tried to publish a version of this book for about 15 years. And every mm -hmm. publisher would reply to him within 15 minutes of, are you crazy? You can't publish <laughs> that. <laughs> are you crazy? Do you realize what you're asking us to do? We can't say that. Uh, so it took him a very long time to to get it out there. And I think the only place I could find it was on Amazon. Um, most places are not carrying the book so far. So do you know what uh, publisher? It, it is? is published by Renegary Faith. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Never it's heard not one of I've heard. <laughs> I know it's it's I think it's not a as common a publisher. Yeah. Um but yeah, so it's been out now for about a month. All right. Cool. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Look forward to next time talking about Play-Doh. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling. Really appreciate you. Uh, thank you, dear listener, for tuning in. Uh, if you would like to join the ranks of our financial supporters, you can visit our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. Um, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we would love to hear from you. You can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Please uh, like and subscribe, I guess, if that's the thing on the platform that you're listening on. Uh, in any case, tell a friend about us. If you're enjoying the show, maybe you know somebody else who would too. Uh, hope you enjoyed the show. We certainly enjoyed making it for you. See you next time. <laughs>